I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Would you pray with me? Father, we honor you and we praise you for all your mercies and grace, the strength that's in your name, the honor that you give to us for allowing us to be in your presence. And Father, we ask you, Lord, that everything that we say today would be in accordance with your purpose and will. It's in your name we pray. And somebody say amen. 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 Last week we began talking about what Jesus said about reward. I'm going to cut this a little short because next week we have Mother's Day. And uh, so we have, typically we have a traditional Mother's Day sermon. But what I do want to touch on today is one of the last things that Jesus said about rewards. And it seems that it brings up a lot of questions. This, this short statement here in Revelation 3 and 11. Because our Lord seems to tell us that we can have eternal rewards right in our grasp, yet lose them somehow. Mm -hmm. And he encourages us to act in a proper motive so that we should, we would be able to obtain those treasures of heaven. Now, the crown Jesus speaks about is mentioned throughout the, the New Testament. James calls it the, the crown of life in James 1 and 12. And then in Revelations 2 and 10, we read the same thing. Paul said it was a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4 and 8. Peter said it was a crown of glory in 1 Peter 5 and 4. And again, Paul speaks up about the crown and says it's a crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, and an incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Whatever is called, it's still the same crown, it's still the same reward. And Jesus is talking about this reward in our text. And as I look at that statement that he makes, it makes me want to pause. As he said, let nobody or let no man take your crown. Mm -hmm. Now in order to understand what is being said, we have to go back to the Greek. Amen. Because it comes very, it comes out very strong in the English. Beware, be aware that no one takes your crown. It almost seems as though it's a violent type of taking. Mm -hmm. That someone can take it out of your hands. But if we go back and we look at the Greek, we see that the Greek word is labano, which means a passive type of taking. In other words, they're only taking what you give. It can mean taking or receiving. In other words, the crown that we have, no one can take it violently. No one can take it by force. But it's taken when we, we, uh, when we allow it to be taken from us. Now, we know that men are not typically in the business of taking from us our e eternal crown. And if we look deep enough, we see the puppet master beyond, uh, uh, the puppet master of people's actions is actually the devil himself. Our Lord said that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. Amen. So whatever actions man takes, Whatever actions is in our life that causes us to relinquish the reward God has given us, the source of that temptation is not man himself, but Satan. But people are often used by Satan. Paul mm -hmm. the time said we, we fight not against flesh and blood, but flesh and blood often becomes a vessel in the hands of Satan, just like you and I can be a, a vessel in the hands of God. So, let me sum up all that I have said up to this point. The verse carries a warning and an admonition. There is a reward, there is a prize, there is a crown that awaits those who remain faithful to the Lord. We must 
hold fast and not give it up. We can't allow someone else to be an instrumental in stopping us from receiving our reward for whatever reason. We must remain faithful in pressing toward the mark no matter what. Mm -hmm. There's many ways that Satan uses people to interfere with our spiritual rewards. Mm -hmm. But I want to just talk about two of them today. And as you, as you survey your mind, I'm sure that you can come up with, with other ways that Satan uses people <clears throat> to hinder our eternal rewards. One thing Satan uses to interfere with our eternal reward is influential people. People that you allow to have influence in your life. And these people can be in the church, they can be outside of the church. Over the years, many have looked up to particular ministers, their deacons, or members as a standard to follow. We've heard accolades like, isn't he or she great? Aren't they a great example? Mm. That person really demonstrates the way we ought to live. Their marriage exemplifies what all of our marriages ought to be like. Mm -hmm. Only to later be shocked when these same wonderful human examples leave the church or get divorced, or do something that is perceived as offensive. Mm. When we allow people, or we allow ourselves to fall into this trap of placing human beings on a pedestal, we're setting ourselves up for a man to be able to take our crown. We have been warned that false teachers will come into the church mm -hmm. in passages like 1 Timothy 4 and 1. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, Satan's instruments come dressed in robes of righteousness and purity. But they're pointing in a direction other than God. They're pointing in a direction that we're tempted to follow. What is possible that if we follow people, we will lose our reward? Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. We have all seen the physical examples of people following blindly. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget when I was a kid and the Jim Jones <coughs> didn't come out. Blew my mind that people, someone could have that much influence on other people. Oh, yeah. True. But it seems to me that there are a certain amount of people in this world that are looking for someone to attach themselves to, someone who has all the answers. Mm. I was watching a documentary a, a couple months ago about this. Um, this cult out of California it had nothing to do with religion. It was, it came off as a teaching on how to live a life that is healthy mentally. Mm. And it, it got so far off that um, people were doing things. When you look at it from a distance, you would go, wow, how is that possible? I want to tell you how it's possible. Sometimes we replace the great example that God has given us, Jesus Christ, with other people. Mm -hmm. And even, even if people are walking a close walk with God, even if they're in the very realm of fellowship with Christ, they can fall aside. Look at Judas, who spent three and a half years in Christ's ministry. He saw all the miracles that were done. He saw the dead raised. He heard the lame, or he, he heard the, the deaf talk and 
converse with other people. He saw the lame get up and walk. He had been a part of many miracles that you and I would only have dreamt of in our life. Yet after three and a half years, he abandoned the great ministry of Jesus Christ and betrayed him. Mm -hmm. See, the problem with following people is not only that they are not always what they seem to be, but sometimes even when they are what they seem to be, they fail down the road. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, we can lock into someone who will cause us to lose our, our crown. True. Very good. What's common in our church movement today is that there's people who will tell folks what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Scripture said in the last days they will draw into themselves teachers having itching ears. And those folks have a large following, but they're following them nowhere. Masses are losing their crown because they've chosen to lift up man instead of God. Amen. These people sound like they have all the answers. They sound like the truth. They seem to make sense. But they're a mixture of truth and lies. Truth and falsehood. And it's not merely in religious robes that these come. He uses other people that are influential in society. Mm -hmm. Actors. It's amazing to me. A person can spend their whole life acting and they'll get on uh, television and act like they're a political expert. Mm -hmm. And masses will follow them. Oh, yeah. He uses politicians. He uses social media personalities. Professors. Even family members. And this problem with family members goes clear back to the days that Christ walked the planet. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I want you to notice that. He, he said, if you love them more than me. You see, because sometime in our life, if we have a love that's greater than God, that love will direct us. I don't care if it is a member of our family. Our love will direct us away from God's will for our lives. I imagine when, and I have never really discussed this with Marcia, but I, I imagine when Marcia uh, told her family that she was going to Cambodia to serve the gospel. I'm sure it didn't excite them as much as it excites us when someone goes to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. I've had many ministers, friends who who was raised in ministry families and all the sheep bites that pastors go through and they told their parents they were called to preach and it was almost as though their parents had a burden put on them mm -hmm. because they didn't want their kids to walk through the same things they had walked through. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we love anything more than God, eventually it's some place in our life it will take us away from God's purpose for us. So Jesus said, anyone who loves her father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We have to be careful because our relationships can cause us to lose our crown. Even our dearest loves in this world can cause us to lose our crown. Mm -hmm. If we desire to keep our reward, we must do what Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, tells us in the 23rd verse. Buy the truth, sell it not. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Amen. We must sell out to God. Amen. With every fiber of our being, every purpose of our mind, we must understand that God's priorities must now become 
my priorities. And God's vision for me must now become my vision for my life. He and my, I can't allow people to interfere with me gaining my reward. I won't give it up. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they think. I have decided to follow Jesus and he's the greatest priority of my life. Amen. Amen. Our Lord said in John 6, 63, speaking of the truth, the way we should walk, he said the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you they are full of spirit as life. Jesus said the only thing that's valuable is what I say. Amen. The only thing that has a, 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 a eternal hope tied to it is what I've instructed. And so the proverb says, I want you to buy that truth and do not sell it. Get that wisdom and instruction. Get that insight that only comes from God. <clears throat> Have you ever been in a place in your life where you had a, a fork in the road and you, and you didn't know which direction to go? Mm. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you somewhere along the way, and all that you had wondered about becomes clear. Now, that don't happen to people who are not seeking God's direction. If all you're depending on is human wisdom and understanding to get you from day to day, if you're not seeking the truth, if you're not seeking wisdom and insight that only comes from God, then you're going to be lost because only God knows the beginning from the end. Only God knows everything in your environment. Only God knows the motives of those that surround you. And only God knows what's going to be a positive influence and what's not. I think of the Old Testament story of Samson. Samson, the Bible said, loved the Bible. And in his love, he couldn't imagine her wanting to harm him one iota. Mm. Oh, sweet little Delilah. <laughs> that fact's not. Well, she wouldn't do anything bad. Come on, love. My mama used to tell me when I was growing up, love is blind. It's deaf and dumb, too. <clears throat> Whoa. Hallelujah, but I will tell you this much. In mind that we should have our eyes as, as we spoke about Jesus. He said that he fixed his eyes past Calvary because he understood the reward. As Paul told us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our love for our God and his direction in our life should be so great that everything else pales beside him. Can I ask you a question before I leave this little segment? Who's influenced your life? Who's directed your life? What people do you have? Are they leading you toward the things of God or are they turning leading you away? Oh, if you follow anyone but Jesus, you follow the wrong mark. No matter how excellent they are, only Jesus can show you the way of perfection. Amen. Amen. It's very true. The next group of people I want to talk about that steals our reward is our offensive people. Anybody ever dealt with anybody that's offensive? <laughs> Do you know that there's offensive people that go to church? Oh, yeah. I've had folks that offended me almost every time I went to church. I could see them coming and I was like, how can I get smaller? Maybe they won't see me. I took my first church. It was a wonderful church. But we had one guy who made it his mission to make the pastor's life difficult. Hmm. I told him one time, after we had later become friends, I said, I know why. God uh, put us together. He said, why? And I said, man, you keep me humble. 
You keep me God dependent. <laughs> I said he, brother. Yeah, girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one time I got up to preach a sermon. I've told most of you this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One time I got up to preach a sermon, and I, I was led to lead, preach the sermon, but I felt like, man, I don't want to preach this because he's going to think I'm targeting him, and he already don't like me. <laughs> I preached that sermon. I was obedient. I preached my heart out. I got out. I went down to the back of the church, kind of cringing for when he was going to walk past me. And for the first time, this guy hugged me. You know what he did? He shook his head in my hand, put his arm around me, and said, Pastor, that was a wonderful sermon. Had they been here, you had really hit them. <laughs> oh. Oh. And he was serious. <laughs> Oh, I want to tell you, sometimes people can be so difficult that if you're not careful, they will steal your reward. They'll steal your victory. They'll steal your joy. They'll steal your triumph. They'll just steal all the things, the life, abundant life that God has desired for you to have. Amen. Oh. Oh, God, don't you know that in that church there's nothing but hypocrites? <laughs> oh, man. I've had people tell me that, and I said, well, you know what? If you're a pastor, you know I'm like, I don't know. I didn't say that, but I thought it. <laughs> oh, sometimes we deal with ordinary people, don't we? And sometimes we can let it defeat us. Sometimes we can allow it to wear us down. Sometimes we can we can lose focus about of what's important. Now we've all seen people fired up for God, but someone along the way hurt them. Mm -hmm. In response, they turn to God or turn from God and have nothing to do with, more to do with Him. Perhaps someone's talked bad about them, rejected them. They have allowed bitterness to get into their heart. But the crazy thing is, they take it out on God. Yeah. We've all been offended. And we've all offended someone else, either intentionally or unbeknown to us. My wife will tell you that I'm probably gentle to a fault when it comes to church folks. But I have preached sermons and I have offended folks. And if I offend you with the word of God, I'm not sorry. But if I offend you with my, my mannerisms, my way of saying things, then I am. Because it's not my desire to offend anyone. But we've all offended someone and we all have been offended. But taking our offense or hurt or pain out on God and removing him from our life is not the answer. Yeah. Right? Acting upon offense and allow, allowing it to govern our life and our relationships with God will open the door for our crown to be taken away. Because we have stopped running the race that's set before us. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Oh, church, I want to take some of my sound crude, but nobody's worth you losing your salvation on. 